Israel tells Gazans to evacuate Rafah. Residents of certain specified neighborhoods to relocate to specified humanitarian safe zones because the IDF will be operating against the terrorist organizations in these areas. Plus, Russian tactical nuclear weapons near the Ukrainian border. It's not the first time that Russian Federation is uh, using nuclear weapons and tactical nuclear weapons topic to demonstrate uh, readiness for further escalation of the war in Ukraine and just to demonstrate certain strengths of the Russian forces. And later, Sweden prepares to host Eurovision, Canadian election interference, Today is Monday, May 6th, and this is VOA's Flashpoint Global Crises. Good evening, I'm Steve Karish in Washington. Some breaking news from the Middle East. To start the show today, it looks like Hamas has accepted a ceasefire proposal from Qatar and Egypt. No word yet on Israeli acceptance to the offer. Visit voanews.com for the latest updates. Meanwhile, Israel has told some 100,000 Palestinian civilians in Rafah to move to designated safe humanitarian zones in advance of a planned Israeli incursion there. Linda Gradstein reports from Jerusalem. Israeli government spokesman David Menser described the Israeli order to move away from the eastern part of Rafah on the southern end of the Gaza Strip. Recent hours, the IDF has informed Gazans in eastern Rafah to evacuate temporarily towards the expanded humanitarian area. We have made Gazans aware through flyers dropped, SMS messages, phone calls, and media broadcasts in Arabic. The text of the flyers is available from the IDF website. They call on residents of certain specified neighborhoods to relocate to specified humanitarian safe zones because the IDF will be operating against the terrorist organizations in these areas. He did not give a timetable, but the Palestinian Red Crescent reported that thousands of residents of Rafah have begun moving northwards towards the safe area of Mwasi. Menser said the move is meant to safeguard the lives of Palestinian civilians and fight the last four battalions of Hamas in Rafah. What we've seen in the past is uh, Hamas have fired directly upon us from uh, safe uh, zones, but this will not deter us. We will move uh, innocent people out of harm's way and then go for uh, Hamas. Uh, Our battle is not with the people of Gaza, it's with the people of, with the genocidal terrorist army. Palestinians in the town of Moasi say the area is already crowded and there is not enough infrastructure to support more people. More than a million Palestinians who have fled the months of fighting in Gaza are sheltering in Rafah, many in tents. There is growing international opposition to an Israeli invasion of Rafah. UNICEF said that 600,000 children there could face a catastrophe if Israel invades. U.S. President Joe Biden also discussed the issue with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Monday. The Israeli move also seems to have threatened ongoing indirect ceasefire talks between Israel and Hamas. CIA Director William Burns was in Israel Monday as optimism faded that Israel and Hamas were close to at least the first stage of a deal. The proposed deal would see Hamas release 33 hostages in exchange for a six-week ceasefire and the release of hundreds of Palestinian prisoners. Israeli press reports said the talks broke down over Hamas's insistence that Israel agree to end the war completely in exchange for the freedom of all of the hostages. The move to evacuate Rafah came as Israel celebrated Holocaust Memorial Day. In a tough speech, Netanyahu said that like the Nazis, Hamas is dedicated to Israel's destruction. Netanyahu invoked the famous slogan inspired by the Holocaust of never again. If Israel is forced to stand alone, Israel will stand alone. But we know we are not alone because countless decent people around the world support our just cause. And I say to you, we will defeat our genocidal enemies. Never again is now. Israel on Monday honored the memory of the six million victims of the Holocaust with a two-minute siren that brought all traffic around the country to a standstill. Linda Gradstein, VOA News, Jerusalem. In another decision drawing widespread condemnation from Western leaders, Israeli police raided a Jerusalem hotel room used by Al Jazeera as its de facto office in the country on Sunday. 
This follows a government decision to shut down the Qatari-owned TV station's local operations, this according to an Israeli official and an Al Jazeera source. Angela Johnston of Reuters reports. This is very dangerous decision against Al Jazeera. The head of Al Jazeera in Israel and the Palestinian territories on Sunday slammed an Israeli government decision to shutter the network's local operations. Walid Omari says he believes the decision against the Qatari-owned outlet was political. It's clear that they want to uh, uh, prevent from any others to know what is happening in this war, in in Gaza, inside Israel, in the West Bank. But Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reiterated his view that the network's journalists threaten national security. His cabinet voted to shut down the network for as long as the war in Gaza continues. Later on Sunday, an Israeli official and an Al Jazeera source both told Reuters Israeli authorities raided a Jerusalem hotel room, which was being used as Al Jazeera's de facto office. This is dangerous because this uh, is uh, 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 inciting the extremists in Israel and the citizens to start attacking journalists, especially from Al Jazeera. A government statement said Israel intended to close Al Jazeera offices confiscate broadcast equipment, and block the channel from Israeli cable and satellite companies. It did not specifically mention the network's operations in Gaza. Al Jazeera has been critical of Israel's military operation in Gaza and has reported around the clock throughout the war in the enclave. I think the Israeli government is feeling pressure by our coverage. In April, the network accused Israel of trying to systematically silence it, arguing that Israeli authorities had deliberately targeted and killed several of its journalists. Israel has said it does not target journalists. The UN Human Rights Office also criticized the closure. There was no official comment from the Qatari government. That's Reuters' Angela Johnston reporting for us today. And as we've heard, Israel has shut down Al Jazeera's operations in the country. The Israeli government says Al Jazeera will be shut down as long as the war continues. For more... VOA's Scott Walterman talks with Professor Joseph Russomano from Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Israel had passed this law that allowed them to do this, so it's not a total surprise that they're shutting Al Jazeera down. But it is still concerning, no? Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, Any... Uh, pretense of advocating and believing in a free press uh, runs 100% counter to this. It's the point that Al Jazeera themselves made. It's hard to run around telling everyone you're a democracy when you're shutting down an entire um, news channel. Well, and I I don't think that is uh, an invalid assessment uh, by any means. Uh, You know, there is the uh, old axiom that uh, a autocratic uh, leader or nation, uh, among the first things they go for is the press and to try to control the press or some aspect of the press so that they can control the information that the citizenry obtains. And so this seems to be at least a page from that playbook. This kind of thing has what effect, generally speaking, if you if we pull back a little bit, it's 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 effect on the population that the government serves. Right. Um, you know, and I. I guess in in many respects, uh, I am compelled to compare it to the the American model. Um, We would never see this sort of thing happening in the United States because of our First Amendment and the way that our courts have interpreted the the First Amendment. Um, And what it does, first and foremost, is prevents the government from doing this very sort of thing to uh, the the news media in general, to the media in general, or to any particular organization that may fall out of favor with the government. And that seems to be exactly what, what's happening here. So to the point of your question, um, I have to think that if nothing else, this is another governmental move that erodes 
the faith and trust that the citizenry of Israel would have in its own government. What else should we be thinking about when we see something like this happen? Well, you know, uh, while I uh, a moment ago invoked the American comparison uh, and the, quote, it could never happen here, unquote, um, uh, fallback position, um, I, I think it, it behooves us, it is beneficial for all of us to, to consider the fact that maybe it could, uh, you know, under certain circumstances, uh, these sorts of things could be uh, in the offing, and uh, it is just a very, very dangerous situation when we as citizens are deprived of any information. I mean, the, the whole idea behind, you know, our First Amendment or any freedom of press-based uh, commitment is that the citizens are by and large, uh, savvy enough, smart enough, and rational enough to be able to uh, absorb any information that is provided to them, sort out the good from the bad, the right from the wrong, and and make uh, their own decisions. That is what a democracy is about. And when that is taken away, as we suggested earlier, uh, then you start eroding at the foundation of a democratic society. Scott Walterman hosts International Edition here on The Voice of America. He was speaking with Professor Joseph Russomano from Arizona State University. You're listening to Flashpoint Global Crises from The Voice of America. I'm Steve Karish in Washington. An update from Kiev coming up in just a minute. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Europe, police in Malmo, Sweden said on Monday that they're well prepared for the Eurovision Song Contest. The first semi-final round is Tuesday night. Well, we can't go into specific details, but of course there's going to be a lot of police officers working in Malmö during this week. Uh, we also uh, have uh, police officers from Denmark and Norway who's going to help us and assist us in our work. And besides that, we will also have a lot of camera surveillance uh, in all over Malmö and uh, police officers who, who are looking at that from the central. That's Jimmy Modin, spokesperson for the Swedish police. Malmö, Sweden's third largest city, has a large Muslim community, with the biggest groups originating from Iraq and Syria. Modin says police are prepared to deal with any demonstrations. We're expecting uh, some demonstrations, of course, and uh, voicing of opinions. And the right to demonstrate is highly protected in the Swedish constitution. Uh, So it's been a part of our planning work since the beginning. So we feel uh, prepared to handle uh, any demonstrations that are uh, going in in Malmö and to see our job is to make sure that those manifestations can be carried out in an orderly fashion. Sweden has promised a dazzling contest, although it has been overshadowed by Israel's military offensive in the Gaza Strip, prompting critics to call for the banning of Israel's contestant, Aidan Golan. Golan's song, Hurricane, was Israel's third proposed entry after the European Broadcast Union, who refused to ban her, rejected two songs over lyrics deemed to be too political. Bookmakers have Croatia, Switzerland, and Ukraine as the top three favorites to win, while streaming data from Spotify suggests a strong chance for the Netherlands, Italy, or even the host nation, Sweden. On Monday, Russia said it plans to hold drills simulating the use of battlefield nuclear weapons. This after what Moscow said were threats from France, Britain, and the United States. VOA's Lori London spoke with Anna Chernikova in Kyiv about the Kremlin's announcement, which also followed a barrage of weekend Russian drone strikes as Ukrainians celebrated the Orthodox Easter holiday. Has there been any reaction so far to this in Ukraine? And is there anything else you can add to what we're hearing? At this moment of time, uh, there is no official reaction yet from the Ukrainian authorities. It is expected that at least certain comments will be done later during the day. We will be following that. However, previously, Ukrainian officials already discussed this issue because it's not the first time that Russian Federation is uh, using nuclear weapons and tactical nuclear weapons topic to demonstrate 
demonstrate a readiness for further escalation of the war in Ukraine and just to demonstrate certain strengths of the Russian forces for the Ukrainian allies as well. So in Ukraine, it is considered as definitely as something to be taken seriously. A lot of experts say that at this point, they do not see a realistic scenario that Russia actually will use this kind of weapons in Ukraine. But uh, there are really high risks, and especially with this latest announcement with uh, actual drills to take place, of course, uh, the risk is uh, getting higher and escalation is getting uh, also deeper. In Ukraine, there is um, understanding that in case Russia decides to actually use nuclear weapons, even tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield uh, in, in Ukraine, Ukraine actually expects serious reaction from the allies and from the West, because as we all remember, Ukraine gave up its nuclear potential years ago, decades ago, and uh, it is expected that Ukraine will get certain uh, defense and security guarantees from the allies. And also, it was a pretty intense weekend for Ukraine as it marked the third Easter at war. Uh, there was no let up in Russian attacks. It sounds like there was a, a pretty intense barrage of drones concentrated on Ukraine's east. Yeah, um, another Easter uh, in Ukraine in the situation of full-scale invasion and uh, another Easter that Ukrainians did expect uh, certain, uh, you know, certain intensifying of the of the shelling, both drones and missile attacks were expected and this is actually what happened. There were confirmations of attacks in different regions of Ukraine, so mainly Sumy, which is in the north part of the country, uh, Kharkiv and Dnipro, which is east, and uh, Odessa, which is in the south. Most of the attacks were targeting either civilian and infrastructure or critical infrastructure and if we're talking about Dnipro for instance, uh, high voltage uh, lines were damaged. Uh, also in Sumy, energy infrastructure was damaged. In Kharkiv, there are also reports of critical infrastructure and civilian area under attack. Even uh, uh, one of the attacks was targeting a very central part of the of the city and uh, at least 20 residential buildings were affected. And also in Odessa, um, critical infrastructure of uh, the port infrastructure were was under attack. So so quite tough weekend for Ukraine amid the Easter time. And uh, of course, a lot of Ukrainians were trying to spend this time with their families. But again, under under quite a high and intensive shelling from uh, from the Russian uh, forces. Anna Chernikova reporting for VOA from Kiev. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laurie. Laurie London hosts Flashpoint Ukraine here on The Voice of America. She was speaking with our Kiev correspondent, Anna Chernikova. An official inquiry into alleged foreign interference in Canada's last two federal elections has released an interim report. As Craig McCullough reports, it did find evidence of interference, but not enough to affect the outcome of the election. The Commission on Foreign Interference in Canada's last two elections found evidence of meddling, but says it did not undermine the integrity of the country's electoral system and did not affect who formed the government. The commission mainly focused on possible interference by China, Russia, and India. After listening to 60 witnesses over three weeks of hearings, Commissioner Marie-José Hoog found in the interim report that disinformation campaigns may have played a part in the nomination process of certain candidates. Interference from China may have helped elect Han Dong in suburban Toronto and defeat incumbent Kenny Chu, a conservative in suburban Vancouver. Dong is currently an independent member of parliament. Speaking in Ottawa, Hoag says this has left a mark on Canada's election process. Nonetheless, the acts of interference that occurred, some of these acts have been established while others remain only suspected, are a stain on our electoral process and impacted the process leading up to the actual vote. In releasing the interim report, Hoag says it is impossible to determine if this interference affected the number of votes for each candidate. Dong was born in Shanghai. Critics say he's spoken favorably about the People's Republic of China, while Chu, born in then British-controlled Hong Kong, has spoken against Beijing. In an interview with VOA, Chu says he's encouraged that Hoag, who is a judge in Quebec, found a reasonable possibility his election defeat in 2021 could have been the result of Chinese interference. However, he says Hoag and the commission need more time. Overall, I'm still uh, fairly uh, skeptic, uh, skeptical to to the uh, to the effort because I, in my personal opinion, I don't think there has been enough 
time given to Judge Hogue to do a proper job. Hogue says in the future, Canada must be careful not to stigmatize different ethnic groups targeted by interference. We must also avoid taking measures that will stigmatize some of our fellow citizens, particularly those from diasporas. But all that make it that much more difficult to fight foreign interference, which is generally, but not exclusively, the work of authoritarian regimes. To a certain extent, it is an uneven battle. In her report, Hoag says the impact was minimal, but may become more severe. She thinks the chance of politicians modifying their platforms due to foreign pressure may happen if sufficient safeguards are not implemented. Hoag says the report has a classified supplement that does not alter her findings and reinforces some of them. She says this report is not definitive, but she does not think the main conclusions will change in the coming stages of the inquiry. The next stage focuses on the Canadian government's ability to detect, prevent, and counter any future foreign interference. The inquiry will launch an outreach program examining different ethnic groups in Canada to get their views and experiences on any foreign interference. A final report is expected by the end of the year. Craig McCulloch for VOA News, Vancouver, British Columbia. And finally today, Australia has agreed to strengthen its security cooperation with the United States, Japan, and the Philippines. Analysts say the move is in response to China's growing assertiveness in the South China Sea. From Sydney, Phil Mercer has the story. Experts believe increased military cooperation with the Philippines is an attempt to counter China's increased aggression. Malcolm Davis is a senior analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, an independent research organisation. He told the Australian Broadcasting Corporation that Beijing's regional ambitions are causing growing concern. What you are seeing is concern that China will continue to escalate its aggression against the Philippines to try and coerce them into backing down and accepting Chinese domination of the entirety of the South China Sea, which China wants as its territorial waters. This is China undertaking hostile actions against a sovereign state in international waters. In response, Beijing urged the Philippine government not to challenge China's resolve to defend China's sovereignty in the region. China has sweeping claims in the South China Sea, which has rich fishing grounds and is a major international shipping route. Davis says China's territorial ambitions could have implications for Australia and the United States would affect Australia because then China could deny our commercial shipping the right to passage through those waters and obviously it would affect US security. Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan and Brunei also have claims overlapping with each other's or China's in the South China Sea. Beijing has refused to recognise a 2016 international arbitration ruling that rejected its expansive claims in the region. Beijing has insisted that efforts by the United States to boost its security alliances in the Indo-Pacific region are aimed at containing China and threaten stability. Phil Mercer, VOA News, Sydney. And that's going to wrap up today's show. There's more coverage 24 hours a day on our website, voanews.com, and across our social media platforms. On behalf of everyone here at VOA, thanks for listening. Until tomorrow, I'm Steve Karish. For deeper dives and expert analysis, listen to VOA Podcasts. Issues in the News explores the biggest stories every weekend, while International Edition keeps you informed every weekday. Plus, with the five-minute newscast at the top of every hour, you're always up to date.